When you hear about cybercrime, you usually think of ransomware. You see all the news and headlines of another company or organization having all their files encrypted and their data breached. The thing is, no one talks about stealer logs. And I mean information stealing malware. When a hacker wants to collect as much information as they can. Things like passwords, credit card information, bank details, any data that they can get their hands on. This is what one of those info stealers looks like. This is the backend panel and dashboard for Redline Stealer. And Redline Stealer is one of the most prolific and common stealers out there. But don't take my word for it. I got to chat with one of the security researchers that tracks and monitors information stealer malware like this and how it's distributed across the cybercrime ecosystem and the dark web. Uh, so my name is Eric Clay. I work at Flare and I do a lot of different things at Flare, but one of the big things I do is security research and specifically research on info stealer malware. I think it's one of the most underappreciated cyber threats today. Right now we see about 400,000 new stealer logs uh, being distributed across Telegram every single day. And that is a ton of stealer logs. And Eric told me Redline Stealer is one of the top dogs. And it's interesting because they use kind of a particular business model. Yeah, it's really interesting. So the, the main one we see is Redline. And we see Redline a lot. I think Redline has been the king for a long time. I think you did a video very recently on Raccoon uh, Stealer panel, which I personally think has the best branding out of any of the, the info stealers <laughs> by far. The, the whole ecosystem here is fascinating. So you have what we call mass vendors, malware as a service vendors, who essentially set up Telegram channels. And it's like a fully automated purchasing process. So they set up a Telegram channel and it says, you know, pay me $300 a month in crypto. They also do like lifetime licenses. Although when you actually look at the code, like the back end code, it's not necessarily a lifetime license. It's like, uh, I think it, it goes till 2026. So it's a little bit of a scam, not not overly surprising given the uh, the marketplace. And then, so other threat actors will essentially buy this. It comes with the command and control infrastructure. It comes with the panel and then they can start distribution. And typically you see distribution through things like malicious advertisements on social media sites, emails, and then cracked software downloads are probably the big three. I, I don't actually know if I ever answered your, or directly answered your question earlier either. So the main one we see is Redline. Redline's been the major dealer for several months now, but then we also see some, some raccoon, uh, Vidar, Planet Stealer, there's like there's like 50 of them. But those are just the big players in the industry, the ones with the well-known name. There are even more. But then you also even see, like we've seen a couple of different open source dealers uh, where people have literally like open source info stealer malware and you have people like forking and uh, like building their own stealers off of that. And then there's like these little niche players. So there's one that recently made the news called Mac OS Stealer. Uh, where it's actually specifically designed to steal uh, credentials and data from like Mac devices, whereas the vast majority of stealers are all focused on Windows and Linux. You really get a feel for the market dynamics because they're actually charging, I think it's like $1,000 a month or something for Mac OS dealers. So it's like two or three times the price of everything else. Part of that price too may be, you know, a lot of companies use Macs where a lot of like people for like gaming and like personal stuff use PCs. So there, there may be like this element of corporate targeting there, right? Like Typically a corporate environment or a, a stealer log with corporate credentials is going to be like more valuable than a stealer log with just a bunch of like personal stuff. All those team accounts go for quite a bit. The thing is like, because you have a stealer that's like specifically focused on Mac OS, um, it, it can be really, really useful uh, to, to like kind of spread for, for corporate infections versus personal. And it's worth noting that info stealer malware isn't using some leet hacker zero day exploit or trying to use some vulnerabilities against some server side technology. It's honestly just a bit more personal. With information stealers, hackers go after your identity. Probably worth emphasizing too, we see the vast majority of info stealer infections and stealer logs being distributed are not targeted at companies. They're targeted at people, bank accounts and Steam accounts specifically. And Steam accounts because people buy gaming accounts are valuable to begin with. And then you can also like steal items off of gaming accounts and then sell them for real money. It's not necessarily easy while well, hacking into like Steam accounts and CSGO accounts. People tend to be a little bit less uh, savvy on like securing gaming accounts because it's just not something as intuitive as like, oh, I should probably maximize my security settings on my retirement accounts and personal bank accounts. All this information could end up being used later for blackmail or extortion or even social engineering scams. When you look through enough CSGO logs, one thing that becomes uh, very clear to you is there's a lot of value in having a lot of people's passwords. There's a lot of value in being able to see all of the passwords one person has used across all of the different websites because some patterns usually become very clear. But there's also the aspect is like when threat actors are planning to attack a company or they, they find somebody that has a lot of sealer logs and maybe the 2FA, maybe the session cookies aren't active anymore, they've expired, so that, that part's not very useful. But what they can still do with it 
is they're going to have the person's form filled data, typically, if they've saved like answers to secret questions or their address, etc., on their browser. So you're going to get the form filled data. You're going to get all of the different websites the person visits, essentially, because you're going to have every website that the person has saved credentials to. It really becomes very easy to socially engineer when you have a user's email address, password, all of the websites they have accounts on, their home address, their mother's maiden name, and all of the form, their credit card number, and all of the form fill data. So I think that's the other part that's really underappreciated here is like the social engineering potential of the amount of information that a threat actor can get from a stealer log. In terms of like impacting an individual's life, it can be really, really significant or even impacting a company if it's used as a, as a, as a uh, vector to get initial access to corporate systems, et cetera. It can be really, really impactful for that company as well. I personally suspect some of the help desk attacks, like uh, I don't want to name any specific companies, but I personally suspect if you looked up some of the companies uh, with the help desk attacks, you'd find that in employees had info stealers, because again, it's much easier to social engineer a help desk if you have all of the credentials of one user, all of the websites they visit, all of their form fill data. And one of the spookiest things about info stealers is that with all the captured data, hackers can usually bypass multi-factor authentication. I, I think credentials are still a major weak point for companies. And I don't think that, I think too many companies are like, oh, well, we have two-factor authentication. Oh, we do credential resets every six months. Like, we're good. That's all we need to do. And it, when it's really <laughs> still a very, very significant act, uh, still a very, very significant problem. A lot of the stealer panels, like they actually have search features. So it's not just like threat actors are just getting these log files and they, they have to like look through all of these and be like, oh, this one's useful. Like it'll literally either call out and say like, oh, this one has a bank account. This one has a Steam account. This one has uh, whatever. Or they can search and they, they can say like, I want to look for Steeler logs that have SSO accounts in them because that's like really valuable to me and I can, I can try to hack into companies. And one other thing to wonder about is how are these Steeler logs getting shared between hackers? How is this malware getting spread or distributed across the cybercrime ecosystem? The other interesting thing we've seen is we actually have seen some initial access brokers who buy Steeler logs in bulk, especially for this purpose. Like we think most threat actors who are interacting with Steeler logs are probably looking for like those consumer bank accounts, etc. because hacking into a company is a little more challenging. But there's definitely a, like this subset of more sophisticated actors who are specifically buying Steeler logs in order to launch attacks against companies. So initial access brokers, like typically they'll sell to one client. So I'll, they'll hack into a company and they'll sell that access to one client. Steeler logs, the way they're distributed is typically they're distributed in like zip files on Telegram channels. And in a lot of cases, they're distributed on Telegram channels with thousands of people in them if they're public Telegram channels. And so there's also this element of like, if there's a Steeler log that has working credentials, which most of them do, they do get like, once the infection happens, they make it to the Telegram channels like fairly quickly. Um, there is this kind of element where there's probably gonna be multiple people trying to break into the this individual's life across all of the different credentials uh, with, and those uh, threat actors are gonna have varying degrees of sophistication. Majority, probably not very sophisticated, but you might get a few who are much more so. And so I think that matters a lot too, because if you are the victim of an info dealer infection and that log happens to end up in a public telegram channel, which I think about 60% roughly do, um, you're, you're probably going to have people trying to hack you like fairly quickly. I think the other interesting thing here is the private telegram channels. And if I was in the audience, I'd ask, well, why are they private and why are they public? Why aren't they all just private? They can monetize them more easily. And so I always compare it to like the free samples you get at a grocery store. Like you go in and they have like little cinnamon sticks and they want to sell you like the whole box of cinnamon sticks. It's Costco free samples, except for cybercrime. And so they, they give them out in the public channels to prove like, oh, I have unique logs that are high value from all of my infections. By the way, come join my private channel. We'll only invite 10 people and it's $500 a month. It's exclusive, but more importantly, it's monthly recurring revenue, just like SaaS companies are valued based on how much monthly recurring revenue they have. And here's the thing, Eric works at Flare. And you know, I am a huge fan of Flare. I love what they do. I think it's incredible, all the visibility and capability that they have. But I really wanted to know, how did they track info stealers and threats like these? So at Flare, like we're, what we're really trying to do is kind of preemptively identify the top ways that a threat actor would break into a company and enable that company to remediate those. So stealer logs are one of our most used features. It's a really, really big area of focus from us as a company, but then also, we also look at other things that we look at ransomware blogs for file disclosures. We look at public GitHub repositories for secrets disclosures, leaky cloud buckets, uh, leak, typically your traditional leaked credentials. I think we have like 14 or 15 billion. We try to take the attacker's perspective and tell you everything that could leave you vulnerable um, before an attacker finds it essentially is the idea. Because when you see 400,000 new logs a day, like that's, that's a massive, massive number of infections. 
And especially if you like, like, you know, Flare has a database of tens of millions of these. And so you can search through them and you can find out if your company's been infected and remediate that. But when you actually search through them and you see how many have like SSO credentials or like access to hospitals or like whatever you might think, you'd be like, wow, this is, seems like a really big issue, right? And I think that there's a few things that are like preventing this from necessarily getting on teams' radars. Number one is when the media refers to it a lot of times because the media isn't always like incredibly like detailed in terms of like how tech savvy they are. It'll say credentials. Everybody knows credentials have been around for decades. Like this is a known thing. Like, oh, I signed up for a website. The website got breached. Now my password that I use for that website is out. I just need to change my passwords. And so I, I don't think people have quite come to grips with like the extent of it because I think a lot of the way it's reported on isn't necessarily uh, easy to understand exactly what they're talking about. I think the second thing is like, if you have an info dealer infection, there's not necessarily an actualization. Like ransomware, boards are concerned about it, executives are concerned about it, it's in the news every day. You know, like a few years ago, I couldn't get gas for like two weeks on the East Coast because uh, the, the Colonial Pipeline was down. And so there, there's like real life impacts that a lot of people have experienced. And if they haven't experienced it personally, they've, they've seen it on the news 24 seven for years. I think with info dealers, it's a bit more of the means to get access to systems that can be used for the actualization of a crime, like a data breach or a ransomware attack. So it's, uh, it's a bit more, it's a bit more under the radar because there's not necessarily like this direct impact that people can perceive unless they've been infected themselves and had a lot of their accounts hacked. I, I think the one thing people might underestimate is when an attacker decides like, we're like, I want to attack this company, like how many tools they have at their disposal to do recon on that company with. And so doing the recon before the attacker does is really, really good. Knowing kind of where all of your weak points are, knowing what leak credentials employees have out there, knowing which employees have leaked the same credential across a bunch of different leaks, knowing which dealer logs may have access to like your single sign-on environment that you're using for your whole company. Like that, that stuff is really, really important. So if we know that this threat of information sealer malware is out there, how do you protect yourself? Is there any way that we can prevent this? Well, Honestly, it boils down to just kind of being smart on your computer. I also think people underestimate how fast the cybercrime ecosystem evolves. Uh, this like cybercrime, even in the past three years, has evolved uh, dramatically. You know, there's a certain country now that doesn't really arrest cybercriminals. It's quite large and has a fairly sophisticated uh, tech ecosystem. Yeah, there, there's just the, the evolution of the cybercrime ecosystem has been very, very rapid. We've seen kind of this increasing level of like role, speci role specialization, commoditization of cybercrime. And I think it's that's one of the key factors that's leading to this huge increase in attacks across the board. And then also Telegram. Telegram is like one of these weird, interesting things where you wouldn't think that like, well, why would Telegram lead to an increase in cyber attacks? And it's like the social media for cyber criminals in a lot of cases and a lot of normal people too, but a lot of cyber criminals do use Telegram like very specifically. A lot of info stealers will actually so self-terminate if they infect a country that's in the CIS, the coalition of independent states, which is like the Russian aligned country. So if it's like Kazakhstan or Belarus or Russia, it just deletes itself off the system, never steals anything. So I, I think that's just a, a very interesting fact alone. And it's not um, all info stealers. I think there's a couple um, where they don't self-terminate in those countries, vast majority do. The second one I was going to say is also re revolves around self-terminating, but a lot of info stealers will actually self-terminate if, uh, like after the infection. So they'll like steal everything, package it up into a stealer log, communicate with the command and control infrastructure, send it out, and then self-terminate on the machine to make it harder to track, which is also very, very interesting to me. Um, I think that there's like a level of sophistication that we haven't necessarily seen with like other malware variants and even going back three or four years ago. Uh, I would say don't save things in the browser. Like that's like the big one right away is like don't save any passwords in your browser because it's that is the main value the stealer is getting. I would recommend people use a password manager. I would recommend people not download necessarily crack software just like on their home computer. Um, not share computers with kids. I can tell you I've seen a lot of stealer logs because um, I, I do look through them from time to time to um, even do some responsible disclosures. And I've seen a lot of stealer logs where somebody downloaded, uh, they have like a bunch of corporate credentials and then it's like Roblox. And it's like, I know exactly what happened here. Not sharing computers with other family members, so especially where you have like corporate credentials or financial data is also really important. Now, with all that said, I hope you're a little bit more educated and I hope you don't forget about stealer logs or information stealer malware. Cybercrime isn't all about, oh, ransomware or denial of service attacks against companies taking stuff down. It's not all those elite exploits and hacks. Sometimes it's just about getting access to information. And, and a lot of security teams, when you, when you talk to CISOs, and even when you talk to like fairly technical security teams kind of across the spectrum, a lot of security teams aren't thinking about this. It's not on their radar. So I think it's, it's something really important to draw attention to. You have 
hundreds of different channels that are distributing Steeler logs across Telegram. And then there's also a dark web marketplace. So the whole thing is just absolutely fascinating. Don't forget there is a whole nother corner and piece of that underground marketplace and dark web ecosystem and enterprise that is a boon for Steeler logs. Yeah, it still shocks me when I talk to Sissa. It's like, this is a big company. And I'm like, oh yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't look at anything like that. Like it's not an area of concern for us. I'm like, how is this not an area of concern for you? Something for you to know and something to help you stay safe. With that said, if you haven't already, please seriously go take a look at Flare. There's a link in the video description. Genuinely one of my favorite companies to work with and just an incredible resource for telemetry, intelligence, and knowing your own attack surface and making sure the attackers don't know as much of your attack surface. Just phenomenal stuff for security research. And seriously, special thank you to Eric for joining me in this video and special thank you to you for tuning in and watching. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.